Well, thank you, Andrew and praise team. Our God is faithful. And it's important to remember that because when we go through life circumstances, it is easy to acquiesce to the challenges that we face in life. And so we're going to continue our, in our series this morning, our Old Testament series entitled Resistance. And so we're, we're looking at this uh, whole aspect of different characters of the Bible and looking at different elements where they're having to resist things. Sometimes we're looking at the positive aspects and sometimes we're looking at the negative aspects of how they deal with resistance. I'd like to ask, have you ever known somebody who you would describe as being stuck? Just stuck. Stuck in life. Stuck in the circumstances of life. Stuck in the difficulties. Stuck in the challenges. Whether it's in a job, whether it's with health, whether it's with relationships. Sometimes that can be something that is really challenging. And when we're stuck, it's so easy to go, take the route of least resistance to being bitter about our circumstances, to be bitter about being stuck, and to let that control and dictate how we live and how we face life. I think of times in my own life when I've been stuck, and I imagine if we're honest, each of us have had times in our life when we have felt stuck. But God wants to teach us something from his word this morning about not staying stuck, not being caught in that trap of bitterness, but moving beyond the circumstances to experience God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his growth in our lives. So as we open up the word this morning, we're going to be looking at a large section of Genesis. Now, I was a little bit challenged because I was like, do I preach five messages on all of these elements or do I do the, uh, the 50,000 foot, foot uh, flyover? And so we're opting for the, the, the overview this morning so that we can understand the larger context in which we see Joseph resisting bitterness. And the thing, main idea that we'll take throughout the message that we see today as we look at these different chapters in Genesis is that bitterness poisons spiritual growth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you that you have given us your word, the Old and the New Testament, to instruct us, to teach us in righteousness, that we might learn the lessons of successes of people in the past and learn from the failures of others in the past because we can't and nor should we experience everything. So help us to have attentive hearts and may your Holy Spirit instruct us in the application of your unchanging truth of your word in our lives so that we might live differently and walk in the victory that you desire for us. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Well, as we've looked at this series of resistance, we started off with Noah and how he was resisting conformity to the world of his day, which was only evil all the time. Then we looked at our second message of Abraham and how Abraham and Sarah, they resisted doubt and they walked by faith when their circumstances seemed insurmountable that they could ever have children, let alone be a, a nation and, a, and, and be a blessing. Then last week we, we looked at Jacob and we saw Jacob, sometimes not successfully, resisting deception and then he became the object of deception himself. But we saw that through his life, how he was able to start to see progress in getting beyond those patterns of deception in his own life. Well, now we're getting into the sons, his, his children. And jo uh, Jacob had 12 sons by four different wives. And the, one of his younger sons was Joseph by his wife, Rachel, whom he uh, loved. And so today we're going to be looking at Joseph and some of those interpersonal family dynamics and what happened there and how Joseph had to make some active choices to resist bitterness. But as we open up the word today, we're going to see that in order to resist the poison of bitterness that poisons and hinders our spiritual growth, that it's important to begin by understanding the factors that influence bitterness. The factors that influence bitterness. Now, as you know from the, the, the stories that we look, the characters that we've looked at in past weeks, Joseph doesn't come in with a pristine generational background. His father Jacob was a deceiver and was deceived. And that created the whole situation of a family dynamic which was complicated, it was messy, and it resulted and carried over into some of the current conflicts that they had. So as we look at these different passages, we're going to look at several passages and snippets to give a, a snapshot into what was going on. We're going to see some generational baggage, and we're also going to see some current conflicts. And all of that points to the favoritism that fosters jealousy, and then the jealousy that drove injustice 
in the life and experience of Joseph. First of all, let's look at a passage in Genesis chapter 37, verses 2 through 4. See, Joseph was a young and favored son by his mother, Rachel, who was the favored wife of Jacob. And then he had a younger brother, Jacob, excuse me, Benjamin. And as they're traveling back from uh, Haran to return back to his home area of uh, Beersheba, I'm not going to, don't have a lot of maps this week because I'm covering so many areas of Genesis. I didn't have time to put up maps for every one. Uh, Joseph's mother dies. And so he's in a bad situation. He's the youngest child, one of the younger children of the favored wife, and his mother has died. But it says Joseph was, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpha. Those were his, uh, two of his, uh, um, uh, the, the children of his uh, father's other wives, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to, of them to their father. Now Israel, who is also called Jacob, so when we say Israel, Jacob, it's the same name. God gave Jacob a new name of Israel, so we'll use those names uh, interchangeably. Uh, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when the brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him, and they could not speak peacefully to him. Well, already we see the problem. We see some generational problems that take place with Jacob or Israel showing favoritism to the son of his old age, his young son, the son by his beloved wife, Rachel. And that created animosity with the other brothers. And then he not only favored him and loved him more, he gave him a special gift, a a very colorful coat as a sign of his his favor. And so he's creating some generational problems. He's creating some conflict between these siblings by how he treats the younger brothers. And they express it that they could not speak peacefully with him. It says that they hated him. Now, one thing that we notice is that hate is a first step to much more serious problems. But there was a, a, an influence that, that was a part of this problem. And the influence was bitterness because of the favoritism that was shown. So we want to make sure that as we look from these lessons, we want to avoid those problems of creating generational barriers, generational problems by showing favoritism, which just creates the the ground for bitterness to grow and to thrive. In verse 37 of the same chapter, it says, And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept these sayings in mind. Because not only did Joseph give a bad report, Joseph had a couple of dreams. He had some dreams in which he was elevated and his brothers were bowing down to him. And he had another dream where he was elevated and even his father and mothers were bowing down to them. And so as we look at these dreams of Jacob and then the report that he gave about his brothers, there was a favoritism that was going on on several levels. Now this favoritism that fostered jealousy could have been flowing from Jacob's own bitterness over the fact that his father-in-law Laban deceived him. And when he thought he was marrying Rachel, he ended up marrying Leah. And so there's that problem. So maybe Jacob was, was fostering this favoritism towards his son based on his own bitterness and the deception that he received. But he made a choice, and that choice resulted in strife among the brothers. It may have been because of insecurity. This jealousy that was fostered because of insecurity. It may have been because of the situation that, uh, that Jacob created with his other sons, that they were insecure in their identity, in the family. What was their role in the family? Their brother Joseph received a special coat of colors. Maybe that insecurity was what was driving this jealousy. But we know that Jacob gave a bad report about his brothers. His father sent him out to say, how are they doing with the pasture? And that bad report could have been due to a couple of things. Obviously, Joseph was favored. It was clear everybody knew it. Maybe it was because he had an entitled and arrogant attitude of superiority towards his brothers because he had the special coat. He was the beloved son. Everybody knew it. Maybe he went and gave a bad report because he had an attitude and he felt entitled. That's a possibility. Or it may have been that he gave a bad report because he operated with excellence of character. 
And he saw that his brothers were messing around and not doing what they needed to do. And they were dishonoring his father by their behavior. So he gave a report and attempt to honor his father so that his father's name and reputation wouldn't be besmirched by the behavior of his brothers. We don't know. But either way, the bad report just added fuel to the fire because of the generational pattern that, Joseph, that Jacob established. A bad report just gave more cause for the brothers to become embittered towards him. And then they had those two dreams. And, and how Joseph responded to these dreams where he is elevated and the brothers are, are bowing down to them through the, the metaphor of, of sheaves of wheat. I'm not going to go into all of the details, but it may have been because he lacked the maturity and lacked the wisdom that you shouldn't say everything that you know in every context. It may have been that a lack of awareness is why he shared that, or it may have been because he had a sense of purpose and he had a sense that God was calling and was going to use him and he didn't mean to do that and to share that in a way of trying to put down others, but to say that God was going to use him and he was going to live into God's purpose. But either way, it was a challenge to the order because he was a younger son. He wasn't the oldest son. He wasn't the most prominent son, even though he was the most favored. And so he's, he's given this bad report, and as he articulates these two dreams that he has, it was challenging the established order of the culture and of the day. And so we see that those are some of the contexts for the favoritism that was building the jealousy that they were experiencing. But it went beyond jealousy. The jealousy and the hatred was what drove acts of injustice. Picking up in the latter part of uh, chapter 37, verses 18 through 21. So they went, the brothers, they have gone off to pasture in a different area, and the father goes to send them to check on them again, okay? Similar to the first situation where he gave a bad report, but he can't find them. And so he's, he's looking for them, and they go, he has to travel way far away. And now it says in verse 18, it says, when they saw him from afar, before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we will say that a fierce animal devoured him. And we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben, Reuben was the firstborn and the oldest son, heard it, he rescued him out of their hand saying, let us not take his life. A little bit later uh, into the chapter it came uh, uh, Joseph comes into the camp and then picking up in uh, verse 16 after they've taken Joseph and they've thrown him into a well figuring out what they're going to do with him. Uh, verses uh, 26 through 28. Then Judah, who was another prominent brother, said to his brothers, What profit is it for us if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not, our, uh, let not our hands be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders, came, Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. So, it's a messed up family. There is some really messed up stuff going on. So not only did that favoritism provoke the jealousy, the jealousy drives them to injustice. Now, this is the real danger of taking offense. The brothers were offended by the special treatment that Joseph received by his father. That doesn't justify that special treatment. Jacob was wrong to be creating this animosity between his own sons, but the wrongness of Jacob didn't justify the plans and the evil of his brothers. Allowing that jealousy to foster bitterness to the point where it drives to injustice. They had a plot to murder him. Taking offense is the first step on the road to bitterness. So when something bad happens to us, whether it's our own fault or whether it's no fault of ourselves, we must resist the temptation to take offense because that's the first step to embracing bitterness, which leads to hatred and plots of murder and other things that are unthinkable. The average person doesn't get up thinking, hey, I'm going to do atrocities today, but it's usually through a series of small bad choices that leads down that road that they don't want to go on. So they start off considering murder. 
But Reuben was thinking, hey, we can't let this happen. But in the meantime, Reuben goes off. They throw him in a well, and Judah, another brother, comes in and says, hey, let's not murder him. Let's sell him as a slave. So at least they downgraded from murder to slave trading. <laughs> not, a great, not a great choice. But so they settled for slave trading. Bad situation. Horrible situation. Can you imagine how Joseph felt to know that his own brothers were contemplating murder and then sold him as a slave to the, the Ishmaelite, Ishmaelite Midianite traders. That's, Midian was one of the sons of uh, Abraham by Keturah. Ishmael was the other son of Abraham by Hagar. And those different sons by different wives ended up having um, intermarriage as, as tribes. And so you'll see the term Ishmaelites and Midianites used interchangeably because they were probably both of those ethnic groups. Uh, and they were trading and going to Egypt. In our family, we have a, a phrase that we used to talk about some of the, the perceived privilege among the siblings. And that th phrase is center biscuit. Center biscuit. Now, you might be wondering, what is a center biscuit? Well, if you've ever made biscuits in a pan, uh, what you do is you, you have the biscuits on the edge, but there's usually one that's in the center. And usually the most favored child likes to get that center biscuit because it doesn't have the crunchy edges. And sometimes one of the siblings or children will declare themselves as the one to have the right to that most precious and most coveted biscuit. And so in our terms, we call it center biscuit. And we know who the center biscuit is in our family. The good news is, is that the other siblings are not bitter towards our center biscuit. Uh, but the thing is, is when you take that on a one level, it can be humorous and fun and you laugh about it. But if you take it seriously, it can result in serious conflicts and interpersonal relationships. It's like the pecking order that can take place. And Joseph, with his favoritism shown to him and his aptitude, was upturning the pecking order. When we lived in Africa, uh, we had chickens. And I had a chicken, and we, they were covered with roosters. And so um, once I was out in the village doing an evangelistic route, uh, training, and uh, the, I was sent back home to my house with a, with a rooster as a, as a thank you for the training that we had done. So I got on the bus, went back home with my rooster. And it was a big rooster. It was a village rooster. And I said, man, this rooster, he is going to take over the, all the chickens in, in, in my yard. Well, that little bandy rooster that I had was not having any of that. And he started pecking that big old village rooster to the point where he was about to peck him to death. And then all the other hens get in, and they were picking on this strange rooster from the village who was a big, strong rooster. Well, we had to put that rooster out of his misery and put him into the frying pan. But the thing is, is that there is a pecking order, and it can be contentious at times. So let us not foster a pecking order which will result in the persecution and jealousy as we interact with others in our relationships as well. What are the factors in your present life or your past that are tempting you to follow or to start on that pathway of bitterness which can lead to many, many other problems as well? Allow the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction so that you deal with that and don't let bitterness control who you are. Well, once the influences of bitterness have been identified, we can resist bitterness by establishing patterns that diffuse bitterness. We don't have to, once we know what we're dealing with, we don't have to go that route. We can make a choice not to go the route of bitterness, but we can actively make choices to diffuse that bitterness. Growing through the injustices that we may face, being proactive and preemptive in how we deal with the things which are hurtful to us. I'm going to pick up in chapter 39, verses 1 through 3. So Joseph, he's been sold, and it says, Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had bought him, brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of the Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And so we see that as Joseph is in this horrible situation as a slave, he ends up being a servant in Potiphar's house, an influential Egyptian uh, uh, ruler, you might say, obviously under Pharaoh, who is the absolute king. But he maintained his personal integrity as he operated even as from a position of unwanted slavery. He was a slave. He was a servant. 
But because he operated with personal integrity, he was given responsibility. He became a blessing to the household of his master, even though he was operating in an unjust situation as a slave. You know, it's, it's interesting to note that when we respond rightly, when we're tempted to compromise, God can honor us even more. But as he's in this situation, as he's helping his master to succeed, to succeed he had some challenges. He had some very difficult challenges that would have exacerbated the problems but he chose to diffuse those things in a proactive and preemptive way. You see, in uh, chapter uh, 39, verses uh, 6, the last part, it says, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. So he's a 17-year-old. He's a good-looking young man. And it said that after a time, the master's wife cast her eye on Joseph and said, lie with me. Now he's facing some very serious sexual temptation. But he refused and said to the master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in his house, and he has put everything in my charge. He is not greater, he is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he would not listen to her, to lie beside her or to be with her. He is facing a lot of temptation. She is pursuing him sexually. He is his master's wife, and he is saying, far be it from me that I should do this wickedness against God, a sin against God. Now the thing is, is he was facing some actual choices And he made an A choice, which was a very good choice. He chose not to feed the bitterness of his situation. He chose not to feed the fact that he was unjustly being been sold as a slave and now was serving as a a servant in the household. He didn't feed it, but he didn't, so he made some very important choices. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. He could have, he said, I see things from God's perspective, and even though he was in suffering, And seeing things from God's perspective, that helped him to say no to a very real temptation that would have been easy to justify. He made an A choice. He made the choice to say no when everybody else in his situation would have been likely to say yes. But if he had an A choice, he also had a B choice that he didn't take. He had some possibilities. He could have leveraged his position as head of the household for his own personal pleasure and gratification. He could have justified a B decision by sleeping with his master's wife by saying, hey, wrong was done to me, so it's okay for me to do wrong to others. He rejected those B choice possibilities to take an A choice because he sought to honor God. He maintained his personal integrity. And by maintaining personal integrity, it helped him to prevent him from going down that road of bitterness. But not only did he maintain personal integrity, he also maintained professional integrity. It says that in verse 39, it says, And Joseph's masters took him and put him in prison, because afterwards his wife accused Joseph of rape. He didn't do it, but the, his master comes home and finds the accusation, so he puts him in prison. And there the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph, in verse 21, and he showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all of the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made him succeed. So once again, Joseph is being proactive and preemptive. He went from a a cush servant job in the household, resisted temptation, chose not to be bitter about that, gets thrown into jail. Man, it's going from bad to worse. If anybody had a cause to be bitter, it was Joseph. He's sold by his brothers into slavery. He's thrown into prison by his master in Egypt. But yet, he's being proactive and preemptive, honoring God, and he's elevated to a position in the prison to be in charge of the other prisoners. Now, some of the servants from Pharaoh, the king's court, get thrown into prison, and they have some dreams. 
and Joseph interprets their dreams. And uh, one is going to be a positive thing and one's going to be a negative thing. Picking up in, in chapter 40, verses 20 through 23, says, On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer, who was one of the guys in prison with Joseph, and the head of the chief baker, who was the other guy in prison with Joseph. And he restored the cupbearer to his position, saying he got his job back, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. After Joseph gave the interpretations of the dream, he, he said to the cupbearer, when the, when the Pharaoh restores you, remember me. And then he gave the interpretation for the baker, and the baker, well, if he would have known that was, well, the, he wasn't as excited because he was going to lose his head. And so now the, the, the fulfillment of the, the dreams are played out, but the cupbearer didn't remember Joseph. So now Joseph has this interpretation of a dream. It's filled out, and things still continue to get worse for him. So the question is, how did Joseph respond even when he was overlooked and abandoned? In the same way that he didn't feed the, 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 the bitterness with his personal integrity, he didn't nurse the hurt in his professional life. He didn't let the wrongs that were done to him become the basis for, for nursing the hurt even more. He made the choice to operate with excellence and to be a blessing because he trusted God, and he trusted in God's timing. So we can personally keep our eyes on the Lord to resist temptation. We can personally trust God in his time and even when we're overlooked or abandoned. He made that choice to operate with integrity. And he also had the option of having those B choices as we saw earlier. He could have made some really bad choices. He could have made B choices and he could have leveraged the, the power for personal gain. He could have leveraged that choice to to make others suffer in the prison. He could have said, hey, misery loves company, and so I'm going to make everybody else miserable with me. But he made the choice not to go the route of making others miserable with him in his own bitterness and pain, but to be a blessing to others even when he was overlooked and abandoned and tempted to compromise. So these are the patterns that diffuse bitterness. Taking a proactive choice to do what is right before God helps diffuse those temptations which lead to bitterness, which become a cancer to our soul. You've heard the phrase, practice makes perfect. And as I've said before from the pulpit, practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect, but whatever you practice is become, going to become the habit in your life. So make sure you're careful not to practice bitterness or you will become a bitter person. And you won't have to wait to be a grumpy, bitter old man or a bitter old woman. You'll be a bitter young person, and that's even sadder. So make sure that as we face these temptations, as we face these challenges, we have a choice of how we respond. So stop doing what is making you bitter. Stop taking offense at the slights of the, the injustices, real or perceived. Stop doing that and then make the positive choice to start doing what is honoring to Christ. Start acting in a way that reflects our focus being on Christ. And that's how we can diffuse the patterns of bitterness that will lead us down paths to make more bad decisions. What are some of the choices that you can make today that will help counter real or potential bitterness in your life. Don't wait around. You've been done wrong. Something bad has happened. Circumstances might be right or wrong. Don't go the route of bitterness, which is the cancer. Well, we're going to continue with this rapid story as we move through because attitude is everything, and we see that in the life of Joseph because right now he is in a bad situation. It went from bad to worse for him, and it looks like he's at rock bottom. But God is not done with his story, and attitude is everything. Even in the midst of all of this, Joseph does not lose heart. But it's not just enough to simply resist. We must overcome, and to overcome, we need to develop perspectives that conquer bitterness. Perspectives that conquer bitterness. And we're going to see the perspectives that conquer bitterness have a human side where people can change and grow and have a God side where he guides us through life's bad experiences. And we're going to pick up in the story as we're going to just highlight some of the things that took place in chapters 41 through 50. 
Well, in chapter 41, Joseph has a dream, uh, excuse me, Pharaoh has a dream. And he has this really disturbing dream, and he doesn't know what it is. But the cupbearer, who has been restored, who was in prison with Joseph, he goes back to Pharaoh. And he goes, hey, I remember now. There was this guy in prison, and he, prophes- and he, and he interpreted my dream, and his dream was correct. His interpretation was correct, and I was restored to be your cupbearer, and the baker was hung. All that took place. Get him. He'll help you out. And so Pharaoh sends for Joseph, and Joseph interprets the dream. And Pharaoh understands that the interpretation of the dream is correct. And so Joseph goes from not only being uh, thrown into a pit by his brothers, considered for murder, sold as a slave, becomes a servant, is accused of, falsely accused of rape, thrown into political prison, uh, gets uh, forgotten in political prison. Now he is elevated to the highest position next to the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, the second most important man in Egypt. He is elevated to that position. And so now he is enacting a plan to save the nation of Egypt when famine was coming. So the famine was throughout the region. And now it not only impacted Egypt, but it also impacted his family that were back in Canaan. So his brothers had to come down to Egypt to buy grain. And that's where they run into Joseph. They find Joseph in Egypt. But the thing is, they don't know it's him. They go in and they talk with Joseph because he's the one in charge of distributing the grain. He's the second most important person in all of the land. And so he is doing his responsibility to provide for the food and he encounters his brothers. And they say in verse uh, 11 of chapter 42, when he asked about them, he said, We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants have never been spies because he accused them of being spies. That was his shtick. Joseph sees them. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him. And he says, you're spies. And they go, no, we're honest men. So now they perceive themselves as honest men. And they're talking to the guy, their brother, that they threw in a pit, considered murdering, and sold him as a slave. Now, a couple verses later in verses 21 through 22, it's not looking good for him. Joseph obviously knows what's going on. So he's trying to find out how they are, if they have changed, because people can change. And it says, they said to one another, and they're speaking in Hebrew. Joseph understands, but he's not letting on. They said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this disaster has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy, but you did not listen? So now... Where comes the reckoning? There comes a reckoning for his blood. They thought he was dead. And so they're saying, wow, we really did him wrong. So they are showing genuine remorse for the distress that they had caused their brother. And then later on and a couple chapters later, Judah, the other brother, both of those were names in the original story. And Judah says, as they're trying to work through this process of of finding out are they really changed, Judah says, now therefore, let your servant remain here instead of the boy as your servant for my Lord, but let the boy go back to his brother. Now, I need to fill in what's going on here. This is a long story, and there are lots of little pieces, and I don't want to take the time to recover every aspect of the story, but Joseph sends the brothers back with grain to their house. And he says, if you're truly men, uh, men of uh, honest men, then come back and bring the youngest brother that you have, Brother Benjamin. And then when you come back, as I'll give you the brother that I'm holding here as a hostage to make sure that you're honest men. And so they go, they take the the grain back to Egypt. They tell their father, Jacob, what happened. And they said, well, if we go down to Egypt again, we have to take Benjamin with us. And he goes, I don't want to do that. They run out of grain, so they have to go back down. And they they send uh, Benjamin back down with them. They get more grain. And then Joseph puts a cup in the the Benjamin's bag. And as they're going back, the Pharaoh's army says, hey, you stole stuff. And they bring them all back. And he's saying, hey, this this, this youngest brother must die. And so there's a whole lot of intrigue. And you're probably not catching all of the story if you haven't heard it before, if this is new to you. But the main thing that you need to take away is that Judah, one of the older brothers, now says, keep me as a slave, but don't punish Benjamin. He realized, and through those words, he's showing that there was a change of heart. Often we say that people can't change. 
And sometimes it's difficult for people to change, but people can change because God is not done with us yet. If you would have looked at me when I was 18 years old, 19 years old, and 20 years old, you would have said, there is no hope for that guy. I had my parents on their knees praying for me. But God can change people. And so there's hope for all of us. No matter what you've been through or what you're going through or what you will go through, there is hope for change. And so people can grow and change, and therefore forgiveness is necessary. It's necessary primarily for those who have been offended because if we do not forgive, then we are held hostage by our unforgiveness, which leads to bitterness, which makes us bitter people, and it can have a lot of generational implications. So don't go the route of bitterness. Let go of that. But it also involves forgiveness of the one offending. The brothers had to forgive themselves because they did great evil against their brother Joseph, throwing him in the pit and selling him as a slave. So they had to forgive themselves. They recognized that they had done wrong. They, and that's been proven by Judah saying, I will serve, be your servant. Let the boy go. Then after all of this, Joseph reveals himself. He says, it's me, Joseph, your brother. And the 12 brothers were shocked. It was, they were shocked. Picking up in chapter 45, verse 5, it says, and Joseph is speaking to his brother. He says, now do not be distressed or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph had a perspective that people can change and that God is sovereign. And so he was seeing that they were distressed. And he's saying, don't let that be a distress to you because I trust in God. I've had my eyes fixed on him even when I was in a bad situation. I made those eight choices, those good choices, even when I could have justified bad choices because I was trusting in God. The brothers, they had a great reunion. They brought their family back together. He was protecting them. He was caring for them. Then his dad, Jacob, died. At this point, they're starting to wonder, Jacob, Jacob's dead. Our father's dead. I wonder if Joseph is going to take vengeance on us now. And so they were worried about that. But Joseph said to them in chapter 50, verses 19 through 20, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you... You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it, about, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You see, even though the brothers were concerned, Joseph reassured them again and again and again. He chose the route of resisting bitterness. And even after his father died and his brothers were concerned that he was going to exact vengeance upon them, he said no. He goes, I'm not in the place of God. You're changed. I've seen that you're changed. But more importantly, God is faithful. He, he used through these circumstances to bring me here to save your lives and to save the lives of many people because of his management of the famine, he kept the nations from starving. God guides us. God guides us. People can change, like I said, and forgiveness is necessary, but trust must be earned. And Joseph went through a process of reestablishing trust with his brothers and they didn't, sometimes they, they had closure, but sometimes we don't have closure on that. But the thing that we need to remember is that God is guiding through those bad experiences. And so we need to understand and trust God's sovereignty, that he's in charge, and that he is directing things for his glory and for our good, and to tr understand and trust God's providence, that he allows us to have choices, and that he is taking us through pathways, and he is redeeming the choices that we make to accomplish good in our lives, and for his glory. As we look at the story of Joseph, we've covered a lot of territory. But the main thing is to remember that bitterness poisons spiritual growth in individuals and in churches and in society. And so when we resist bitterness, we are doing good for us personally, for us corporately in a group, and for society at large. When you're lost, you need to establish the fixed point of reference, and you need to recognize landmarks along the way. Our eyes focused on Jesus, who did not become bitter but sacrificed himself for us, helps us not to embrace bitterness when we go through difficulties in our lives. What is your perspective on the events of your life that have been painful? Is it, I'm going to get my vengeance, and I'm going to make sure I get justice the way that I want? Or, or are you going to say, 
I'm going to trust God with his process in me and in the lives of others to bring about good because God is great. Yeah, bitterness poisons spiritual growth, but we don't have to do that. What's your next step going to be? How are you going to respond? We all face those challenges. I know that we have things from the physical standpoint, sicknesses, jobs, health, relationships, whatever it is that's becoming a temptation for you to embrace bitterness, I exhort you to resist that and trust that God will do his amazing work if you will yield to him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you.